All right, so AP Euro first semester review part B. And we're going to get right back with Louis XIV and his wars. He wanted to expand France to its natural frontiers, what he considered its natural frontiers, and he wanted to gain Spanish Habsburg lands. Uh, other countries would ally against France to keep a balance of power in Europe. And uh, one of his wars, the War of the Spanish Succession, it was over Louis XIV's heir, Philip V, his grandson, who was becoming king of Spain. And this is going to be a problem for other countries because that would mean that the king of Spain would eventually inherit France, and someone being king of, Frain, uh, of, of Spain and France is just too much. So um, you have a war. The Grand Alliance of England, Holland, Austria, Brandenburg, and Savoy in Italy. A great deal of debt would be created for France. The Treaty of Utrecht, a very important treaty. You need to know the Treaty of Utrecht. Philip V gets to be the king of Spain, but he does not get to be the king of France. England gains Gibraltar. It gains the Asiento, which is this agreement that allows it to sell slaves and some other goods in uh, the Spanish colonies. Uh, they get Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Austria gets the Spanish Netherlands, which henceforth for a while will be called the Austrian Netherlands. They get Naples, Milan, and Sardinia. Savoy will gain Sicily, and the, and, uh, the ruler of Savoy will be uh, called a king, and then trade Sicily for Sardinia. Brandenburg, the elector of Brandenburg, will get the title of king. And Brandenburg is the beginning of Brandenburg, Prussia, which becomes Prussia, which becomes a united Germany under the Kaiser. Spain. Spain has a complicated absolute monarchy during this time period. Um, so complicated, we really don't need to delve into it. There really won't be a whole lot of test questions over that. It will suffer economic decline due to a loss of Jewish and Muslim merchants and artisans, uh, thanks to forcible expulsions. It will suffer from inflation and uh, a failure to foster domestic industry. It will also have costly wars with the Dutch and the French. Also, its leadership will begin to suffer. Uh, the extravagance of the upper class will continue even with the declining economy, and there will be population loss in Spain. They'll also suffer military defeats. Spain and the Dutch would both lose out to England and France because of war, competition, and small populations during this time period of state consolidation. The Eastern Empires are already in decline. The Holy Roman Empire, Poland, and the Ottoman Empire are in decline at this point. The Holy Roman Empire, HRE, uh, was divided by strong princes and also divided by religion between Lutherans and, and Catholics. Poland had a weak central government thanks to the Liberum Veto that was part of it, where you had to have a complete agreement to get laws passed. And this made Poland weak and vulnerable to invasion. The Ottoman Empire... Uh, had failed to make any competitive reforms. Their economy had been hurt as the Atlantic economy uh, became stronger and more important in world trade. That meant that the Mediterranean trade that the Ottoman Empire had uh, tapped into uh, weakened and overland trade as well. There was a Habsburg resurgence even with all this going on. The Habsburgs, uh, they are entrenched in Austria, Bohemia, and Hungary. Uh, with the Treaty of Utrecht, they gained the Austrian Netherlands and uh, large portions of northern Italy. Um, the Habsburg Empire is essentially Catholic, but there are many ethnic groups, and later on, when nationalism happens, that's going to be a problem. Charles VI's pragmatic sanction was designed to get uh, other rulers to agree, and, and, and the leaders within uh, the Habsburg Empire, to agree that Maria Theresa would be accepted as his heir, even though she was a woman which was kind of unheard of in, in uh, Central Europe at the time. Not unheard of in England, but in Central Europe this was kind of against the rules. So he had to get the pragmatic sanction going. Hohenzollern, Brandenburg, Prussia. Hohenzollern is the family that controls Brandenburg, Prussia. Brandenburg starts out small but adds a lot of land, cleaves Prussia, uh, various other territories. It will end up being the second largest territory in the Holy Roman Empire, but it is not contiguous. That means it has these patches of land that aren't connected together. You know, kind of like with the United States, we have contiguous 48 
States, and then you have Hawaii and Alaska. Frederick William, the great elector, uh, will create a strong army. He will gain the uh, loyalty of the Junker, the nobility. Frederick William I uh, will have a very large army, and he will militarize the culture. So uh, the famous quote roughly saying that uh, in, in Prussia you don't have, uh, you know, the country doesn't have a military, the military has a country. Then we get to Peter the Great. Uh, his, his Russia had been landlocked and isolated. Uh, Peter the Great sought to modernize Russia and gain a port on the Baltic Sea. He toured Western Europe to get ideas about what to do to modernize. He expanded the army. He built a new navy. He introduced the potato, which helped uh, increase the population. He imported uh, craftspeople, artisans, and he was also known as the Barber King because he made some basically aesthetic changes, wanted the nobility in Russia to look more European and uh, less Asiatic, so he made them cut off their beards or pay a, a beard tax. And uh, if you paid your beard tax, you got to keep your beard, but you had to wear this little thing around your neck. And uh, he would literally, at, at parties and stuff like that, kind of stand by the door and wait for someone to come in, and if they didn't have their little deal and they had a beard, he would cut their beard off himself. That's why he's the barber king. He won the Great Northern War with Sweden, which gained a Baltic port. He built St. Petersburg on the Baltic coast. He used serfs to work in mines and factories. Unlike in Western Europe, where the serfs had were bound to the land, you could actually sell your serfs in Russia. You know, the, the boundary between serfdom and slavery is even harder to find in Russia than it was in Western Europe. Uh, he modernized Russia, but selectively. He was basically focused in on increasing its industrial power, its heavy machinery power, its guns. He wanted a strong army. And he also increased the burden on the peasants in the process. So now we get to the scientific revolution. Aristotle and Ptolemy uh, are the reasons why many people bought into a geocentric concept of the universe. Uh, the church also taught that God had placed the earth at the center of the universe because earth was a special place. Copernicus is going to develop a heliocentric view uh, where he, he argued that the earth revolved around the sun, but he also argued that the sun was the center of the whole universe. Kepler used Bray's data to argue for heliocentrism, uh, and he added elliptical orbits to an explanation of how uh, the solar system worked. Galileo had uh, studied laws and developed laws of motion and inertia through experiment. He also built a really good telescope and looked through it and found irrefutable support for heliocentrism, but he had to recant under threat of torture by the church. So the scientific method is kind of a combination of Bacon's inductive method and Descartes' deductive method. Bacon's induction. Uh, you observe phenomena, you come up with a hypothesis about explaining why the phenomenon happens, and then you develop tests with controlled experiments to test your hypothesis. Descartes' deduction is deductive method. You use logical reasoning to deduce truth. You develop a general principle from which to explain phenomena. Um, where, while most people after these two guys will kind of lean on Bacon's inductive method, they still do use Descartes' deductive method. And the scientific method is basically a belief in regular patterns in nature. And you can discover what those regular patterns mean by the use of experiments, records, and math. Scientific societies were sponsored by governments. They promoted research and scientific knowledge. And they created an international scientific community. And then we get to Isaac Newton and his book Principia. He explained earthly and planetary motion with the concept of gravity. Uh, he had his three laws of motion. He argued that the universe was governed by mathematical laws. There was no emphasis on the supernatural in his works uh, about science, but Newton was deeply religious, and his ideas would dominate Western thought until Einstein. The Enlightenment, the ideas behind the Enlightenment. They argued that reason was, was uh, the most uh, the thing you should focus in on to explain the world around you, not miracles. They believed that nature was rational, that natural laws were discoverable because nature was rational. Happiness, they argued, was a goal in this life. Progress was a big focus. Social progress could be made through 
through understanding social laws, how, how societies work, and the best way to order societies for progress. Liberty was a natural right, and it would further progress. Toleration was important. Uh, they questioned religious institutions. They questioned superstition. And they questioned religious intolerance. Deism. Many, but not all, Enlightenment thinkers were deists. Uh, deists believed that God was kind of like a watchmaker. He created the universe, but then he let it run without intervening. Uh, so they emphasize reason. There's very little emphasis on emotion. Uh, it's really popular with the educated elite in Europe and America. But because of this emphasis on reason and not so much emotion, you're going to have the pietist movement. This uh, a reaction to deism where you have people who argue uh, for a very emotional and a personal relationship in religion. The philosophes, these were thinkers and writers with enlightenment ideas. They wanted to improve society through reason and natural law. Many uh, French uh, thinkers were philosophes. Many of the philosophes were French, but uh, there were other Europeans and Americans who were also philosophes. Voltaire is the best known philosopher. He popularized Newton's ideas. He criticized religious intolerance and institutions, and he emphasized freedom of expression and belief. And absolutely opposed ignorance. So Voltaire is kind of a big deal. Diderot. He's the chief editor of the Encyclopédia, or Encyclopedia. His goal was to gather the most current knowledge in all things. It, the Encyclopédia spread enlightenment thinking. It undermined the authority of uh, the church and rulers by including controversial ideas. Montesquieu wrote Spear of the Laws. He used reason to study government. He believed that the ideal government was a limited government through separation of powers and checks and balances. And his writings and ideas influenced American political development. Rousseau was sort of, he's kind of lumped in when you, you learn about the Enlightenment, he's lumped in there, but he's so different from everybody else in the Enlightenment. Some people argue that he's more of a romanticist, or just call him post-Enlightenment. He argued for natural education in his novel, Emile. Uh, he believed in discovery learning, letting kids kind of grow up and draw their own conclusions. He uh, arg argued forcefully that there were developmental stages, and not everybody develops at the same rate in the same way. He argued for the general role in the social contract. Hobbes and Locke had framed a social contract as an agreement between individuals and rulers. Rousseau argued that soci the social contract was an agreement between individuals to each other. Therefore, the individuals, the community, were the sovereign power, the general role of the community. Rulers were servants of that community and could be removed if they were tyrannical. He influenced the French and American revolutions, and he also even influenced the language of dictators who would argue that what the things they were doing were, were based off the general will of the people. He distrusted reason and science. He felt emotion had its place. And he also argued that civilization was corrupting. So in, in many ways, he disagreed with the other people you study when you study the Enlightenment. Physiocrats. Uh, French economics was the pl first place to question mercantilism. Quesnay was the leader of these French e economists, the physiocrats. They argued for a laissez-faire policy of non-interference in the economy. Adam Smith uh, is another laissez-faire guy. 1776 writes The Wealth of Nations. He argues governments should not interfere in free markets, that the government role uh, was to defend the country, protect property, and enforce contracts. He argued that the law of supply and demand uh, is self-regulating and would help control prices in the economy. He argued tariffs would hinder free trade and should be uh, abolished or ended. That every individual is self-interested, -interest but that, that competition and self-interest are socially beneficial, generating wealth to everyone. And what he did is he combined the economic thoughts of other laissez-faire thinkers into a single system, which is why when you hear about laissez-faire economics, you usually hear about Adam Smith and not Kesney or somebody else. Romanticism. Big in Europe in the first half of the 1800s, it stressed the importance of emotion and intuition and understanding not just reason, uh, like the Enlightenment. Uh, romantics looked to the medieval period for models of heroism and mystery. Romantics stressed the beauty and power of nature. Uh, 
not its uh, you know function as a machine. Um, romantics believed in a loving, personal God, not a deistic watchmaker. So emotion, uh, medievalism, beauty and power of nature, it's mystery. They like mysteries. Romantic writers, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, who wrote lyrical ballads, Schiller, Ode to Joy, Goethe, Faust, Scott, Sir Walter Scott, Ivanhoe, Victor Hugo, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Grimm's, The Grimm Brothers, their fairy tales. This all happens during the Romantic period. Romantic artists, Friedrich, The Wander Above the Mist, Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People, Constable, The Haywain, Turner, Hannibal Crossing the Alps, Goya, The Third of May. You know, lots of emotion, action, uh, pictures of nature with storms and up in the mountains with beautiful, you know, mists and clouds and stuff like that. Oceans with big crashing waves, sharks and stuff. Composers, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Wagner's Ring of the Nibelung. Romantic studies of the past help stir nationalist, nationalist feeling by informing people of their culture. Many romantics celebrated the Greek revolt, revolt in 1821 because of its legacy, the Greek legacy to Western civilization. Now we get to enlightened despotism. Uh, the monarchy uh, was the, still the dominant form of government in Europe in the 1700s. Divine right arguments during this time, however, will be changed into arguments for enlightened despots. The idea of enlightened despots as being servants of the state. They're in charge, but they are taking care of their people. As opposed to God placing them there, that's kind of the emphasis now, is, is they are servants of the state. The aristocracy is still strong in parts of Europe. The great powers of the time are Britain, France, Austria, Prussia, and Russia. The lesser powers of the time are Spain, Holland, Poland, Sweden, and the Ottoman Empire. The great powers fought limited wars for limited objectives during this time period. African slavery provided sugar production, while eastern serfs provided grain production. Events of the time. Prussians and Austrians were continental rivals. The British and French were overseas rivals. Uh, in the War of the Austrian Succession, you basically have these rivalries play out. Frederick the Great ignored the pragmatic sanction, and he invaded Silesia. He was supported by France, which meant that the English would support Austria. Americans invaded Canada. The French would take Madras, India, from Britain. And eventually, you have the Treaty of A La Chapelle. Prussia keeps Silesia, which demonstrates the strength of Prussia. The Seven Years' War is, is basically a continuation of a lot of that conflict. Uh, Britain will invade French colonies and trade posts. There, an anti-Prussian alliance will almost crush Prussia until the new Tsar, Peter III, not the brightest guy in the world, drops out of the war because he, he thinks the world of the Prussian leader. The Treaty of Paris, British gets Canada, France gets back some Caribbean islands, and trade posts in India, Prussia will keep Silesia. Enlightened despotism. The philosophes will suggest absolute monarchs uh, use their power for the good of the people. George III and Louis XIV, not so interested in the philosophes George III of, of Britain. Catherine the Great of Russia, though, will kind of play at this, this idea of being an enlightened despot. She'll correspond with Voltaire and Diderot. Uh, she'll make some enlightened reforms, less torture, more toleration, and attempt at a new law code. But the nobility will put an end to that attempt at a new law code. Uh, she'll change her mind about enlightened despotism uh, because of Pugachev's rebellion. It's a serf rebellion. It ends Catherine's attempts at reform. She'll give more power to the nobles over their estates and serfs to keep a rebellion like that from happening again. Uh, she fought wars, uh, t uh, counter to enlightenment ideas. You know, enlightenment uh, thinkers thought wars were counterproductive. She's fighting wars against the Ottomans and, the Pol uh, and, and Poland in order to gain territory, in order to gain a port on the Black Sea. 
She'll gain the Crimean, the Crimean Peninsula is in the north part of the Black Sea, and she'll partition Poland with Austria and Prussia, and Poland will be uh, partitioned three times, the third time meaning Poland ceases to exist as an independent force. Frederick the Great of Prussia will call himself the first servant of the state. He supports scientific agriculture, uh, a unified law code, less torture, and religious toleration. But the Junkers, the nobility, are still firmly in control of their serfs. The guy who probably is most sold on the idea of uh, enlightened despotism, uh, kind of like his mother, Maria Theresa, Joseph II of Austria, he'll abolish serfdom and feudal dues. He'll abolish forced labor, called the Rabat. Uh, religious toleration for Christians and Jews is established. Uh, he reforms laws and reforms the courts. He ends torture and capital punishment. There's not less torture, there's no torture. Uh, and nobles oppose some of these reforms. Uh, when his brother takes over, Leopold II will repeal many of these reforms. Art. During this time period, uh, you have two kind of movements, Rococo and Neoclassicism. On Rococo, it peaks under Louis XV. Uh, its subject is lighthearted, frivolous nobles at play. They use pastel, light pastel colors, highly decorated ceilings in the architecture, and uh, famous paintings, Watteau's Pilgrimage to Scythera, Boucher's Cupid, a Captive, and probably the most famous one, uh, Fragonard's The Swing with the Noble, He's kind of laying down, and, and the lady's on the swing, swinging, and he's looking, and frankly, it kind of almost looks like he's looking up her dress. Neoclassical art displaces Rococo around the, the 1780s. The key figures of neoclassical art are uh, classical heroes with classical themes of self-sacrifice -sac and service to the state, emphasis on restraint, symmetry, simplicity, so David's Oath of the Harati and Houdon's Voltaire Seated are examples of the painting. Jefferson's Monticello in America is an example of the architecture, neoclassical architecture. The old regime and society, the social class system of the old regime. You had the nobility, the clergy, the middle class, and the lower class. In France, the way this is described, and it basically is described everywhere else as a result, is the first estate is the clergy, the second estate is the nobility, and the third estate is made up of the middle and lower classes. Life in the 18th century, before 1750, you had nuclear families. Uh, marriages were in the mid to late 20s to acquire property or learn a trade. After 1750, cottage industries increased income. This reduced arranged marriages and social controls. You still have nuclear families, though. Young peasant women will increasingly leave home to work as domestic servants. Uh, children, high mortality rates meant that parents were reluctant to become too emotionally attached. Rousseau in, uh, encouraged warm, nurturing parenting, had a big impact on the upper and middle classes uh, where they began emphasize raising children more uh, because of Rousseau's writings, uh, including uh, you know, less wet nurse uh, practices among um, the, uh, the upper class because of Rousseau. Witchcraft, 16th and 17th centuries, there is this kind of witchcraft uh, hysteria. 40 to 60,000 people will be executed as witches. The targets often were elderly, widowed women. They were economically vulnerable. Why the scare? Uh, emphasis on the devil's power in, in religious uh, movements. Sexism. Economic changes, which made everybody kind of worried and anxious. And when people are worried and anxious, they look for scapegoats and religious wars. Why did it end? The religious wars ended. There was a Protestant emphasis on a supreme God that became more prevalent. Uh, so this, uh, sc the scare of the devil is it's a little less significant. And uh, enlightenment attacks on superstition. We're moving into the age of revolution, really the age of political revolution. Uh, remember the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution influenced the American Revolution? The American Revolution was also influenced by the Enlightenment. Americans read the works of radicals from the English Civil Wars and the works of John Locke and Enlightenment authors Voltaire, Rousseau, Montesquieu, etc. 
George III attempted to assert more authority in the colonies than had become the norm. This was interpreted in the light of radical enlightenment thought, as well as American understandings of English political institutions and rights, which meant that they thought this was a usurpation and it was tyranny, and so they fought back. The French Revolution causes a lot of debt. Why? Because of Louis XIV's wars, because of the Seven Years' War, because the, uh, the French, to get back at the British, financed the American Revolution. Also, poor royal leadership. Louis XV was not the most active king. He, he just kind of liked having fun. Louis XVI was earnest and tried to be responsible, but he was weak. And he still suffered from a poor reputation. Uh, his wife was considered to be uh, incredibly um, promiscuous and uh, extravagant. The Parliament of Paris asserted power to limit the monarch. This is another problem for the French uh, monarchy. Peasants were in trouble. You know, you throw all that together and then you have this. This is probably the, the big thing. The peasants were in trouble. They were incredibly burdened in France. Over half their income went to the tail the gabel, fuel dues, church tithes, forced labor called the corvée, and then the poor harvest happened. This meant rising bread prices, it led to bread riots, and you have unwilling aristocrats. They had tax exemptions, they resisted attempts by others to determine tax reform. Uh, as we read, we know that the aristocrats were interested, they knew that there had to be some changes in the tax code, they wanted to make the changes. Events of the French Revolution. The Estates General will be called in order to get some tax money raised. There will be a conflict over the voting strength of the three different estates. The third estate will declare itself the National Assembly. Uh, when they're locked out of the place that they've been meeting, they will take the tennis court oath to draft a constitution. Louis XVI will call out his army. A mob will take the Bastille to gather up guns and ammo to make sure that the king's army doesn't you know, cut down the revolution in Paris. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen will be issued, emphasizing things like freedom, equality, life, liberty, property, security, toleration, due process, and free speech. Proto-feminists will issue a Declaration of the Rights of uh, Women and the Citizen, um, and also they will get some, some benefits that temporarily women will have increased rights to inherit, and uh, more liberal rights to divorce. They won't really get political rights. There will be a swing back during the French Revolution ag against these slight increases in women's rights. Mary Wollstonecraft will argue for women's natural equality in a vindication of the rights of women. Women will march on Versailles to take the king back to Paris. The civil constitution of the clergy uh, confiscates church land and requires the priests to uh, swear a loyalty oath to the state and become state employees. The National Assembly will create a constitutional monarchy, get rid of the old provinces and set up 83 departments, establish the metric system, end internal tariffs, which makes trade within France more profitable and will make the economy grow, and they end guilds. They'll try to protect private property, uh, but they do not give women the right to vote. The Legislative Assembly. Conservatives are sat on the right, moderates in the center, radicals on the left, and that's why you hear that Republicans are on the right and Democrats are on the left, because of that language. Jacobins wanted a republic. Girontists wanted a war to extend the revolution. Austria and Prussia issued a de declaration of Pilnitz in favor of restoring absolutism to France, which freaks France out. The legis Legislative Assembly declares war. They fought against the First Coalition, were beaten badly. But French patriotism will lead to a rally. In the summer of 1792, the sans culottes, the working class, uh, will take over the Paris Commune, which is the city government, and the Paris Commune will intimidate the Legislative Assembly. Louis XVI will be deposed, and a convention will be formed to form a republic. And the September massacres will happen against the bourgeoisie, the priests, and the aristocrats. So now we have the National Convention. The Girondists wanted to imprison Louis XVI. The Jacobins, under the leadership of the Mount Mountain, wanted to execute him. The Girondists rem were removed from power. The king was executed. Burke, the Englishman, criticized the revolution, warning that it would lead to anarchy. 
Modern Europeans saw the violence and executions as proving Burke right. Jacobins still faced resistance from Girondists, Royalists, and Catholics as they tried to institute this more radical Republican French Revolution. The Committee of Public Safety's uh, Reign of Terror, the Committee of Public Safety was formed. Uh, Robespierre promotes a republic of virtue through mass executions of class enemies. He proclaimed a levy en masse, a military draft. There would be total mobilization for war for the first time. This large citizen army would beat back the first coalition's mercenary armies. Thermidorian reaction in the directory. Robespierre pushed too far and was executed. The Committee of Public Safety was ended. The directory, an executive body of five, and a bicameral legislature were established. Uh, but the directory government was corrupt and popular. There, were, there was inflation, food shortages. This would lead to a coup by Bonaparte and others. So the consul is formed with Napoleon. Napoleon will rule absolutely as the first consul. He uh, will be very popular as the French economy improves and the second coalition is beaten. He uses democratic processes to essentially destroy democracy. He modernizes France, establishes the Napoleonic Code, or the Civil Code, uh, creates equality under the law, toleration, the end of privilege, uh, and uh, it is conservative on social uh, laws. The Concordat of 1801 uh, establishes it's an agreement with the Pope. Catholicism is the majority religion of France, and Pope gained many of his old appointment powers but the confiscated church property was not returned, and not, Napoleon also had some appointment powers. Napoleon used censorship, intimidation, and the secret police to maintain his dictatorship. Napoleon declared himself emperor in 1804. He won victories from 1805 to 1807. Had a brilliant victory at Austerlitz that established his, his uh, reputation as a military genius. By 1808, he controlled the North Sea to Spain, to most of Italy. At the Battle of Trafalgar, uh, he was uh, defeated, which prevented a seaborne invasion of Britain, all thanks to Horatio Nelson, Captain Kirk's predecessor. He dissolved the Holy Roman Empire and created the Confederation of the Rhine and ended feudalism there. And, and also, French nationalism sort of stimulated the birth of German nationalism. The fall of Napoleon. The continental system hurt Europe more than Britain. The guerrilla wars in Spain uh, drained time, energy, and, and manpower from uh, the French government. And it, Napoleon's invasion of Russia was defeated mainly by General Winter, the Winter, which killed a huge percentage of his army. Uh, his final battles he lost at the Battle of Nations at Leipzig was sent to the island of Elba. Um, the 100 days was when he escaped Elba and came back to rule. And then he loses the Battle uh, of Waterloo and is sent to St. Helena. And he'll die there in 1821. Results of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. The collapse of the old regime, the idea of equality and, and, and illiberalism are going to be uh, germinating everywhere in Western and Central Europe nationalism, and also a, a great fear of another general war, which creates a stronger focus on a balance of power. So the conservative reaction, traditional institutions of power are the monarchy, aristocracy, the church, and then the social concept of the patriarchy, the idea of the man being in charge, the husband, the father. Conservatives believe traditions were essential foundations of society and any change should be gradual. And uh, this appealed to those who were frightened by the French Revolution, which were a lot of people. So challenges to conservatism, though. Industrialization, liberalism, and nationalism. Industrialization was a huge socioeconomic change. Uh, it led to the rise of a new middle class, the bourgeoisie, which wanted a larger role in government and created a new class of urban workers, the proletarians. Liberalism was the belief in natural rights, civil, civil liberties, constitutional monarchies, and laissez-faire economies. Basically, those enlightenment political ideas on steroids. They did not trust full democracy or sympathize with the lower class, though. Nationalism. 
A belief a uh, nation of people with similar traditions, history, and language should have its own sovereign government, and people should be loyal to their own nation state, not a monarch. This led to many independence movements. So in Austria, Metternich, he's the architect of this conservative order that's going to be around in 1815 till somewhere between 1850 and 1875. The Congress of Vienna is going to stress legitimacy. It's going to restore the ruling families, the royal families of various kingdoms and principalities in Europe. It's going to focus in on a balance of power. France gets its borders set to the borders they had in 1790. The Austrian Netherlands will be united with the Dutch Republic to make a stronger Netherlands to help keep France under control. Uh, or well, to help keep France from being able to control others is more like it. The 39 German states will be established into a loose German confederation led by Austria. Switzerland will be a neutral independent nation. And Sardinia gains territory in Italy so that there's a stronger power in Italy to also help check France. Territorial settlements, Russia gets more of Poland, Sweden gets uh, Norway, Prussia gets two-fifths of Saxony and the Rhineland, Austria gets Lombardy and Venetia, uh, Britain gets Malta, the Cape of Good Hope, Trinidad, and Tobago. The balance of power will last until 1871 with German unification, but it will fail to stifle liberalism and nationalism. The Congress system and the Quadruple Alliance will form a concert of Europe, if you will, Cooperation in international affairs, at least in Europe, this is the newest, this is, this is a pretty new thing. The idea these countries are going to work that closely together to d try to maintain a certain system. So early revolts and resistance against the conservative order. Early on, Spain, uh, there will be a revolt against repressive Bourbon policies. It will be stopped by French forces. In Naples and Sardinia, their revolt will be stopped by Austria. German students will be pushing for a liberal united Germany. The Carlsbad decrees of censorship and harassment will stop that. The Decembrist revolt in Russia, a group of army officers wanting constitutional reform, will be put down ruthlessly by Nicholas I uh, and his oppressive government. So one of the forces that's going to challenge conservatism, industrial revolution. Remember that there was an agricultural revolution. Traditional agriculture used an open field system. Animals grazed on shared common or open lands. Villagers divided farmland into long, narrow strips. There were no fences or hedges. They used two-field or three-field rotation, leaving some land fallow, unfarmed, to avoid soil exhaustion. The low countries are going to start making some big changes. The low countries are like Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg. They're densely populated with a growing urban population. There's not enough farmland using the open field system. So they start closing up the fields, start fencing in the fields. They use continuous crop rota rotation thanks to nitrogen fixing crops. They use manure as fertilizer. Uh, of crop variety is emphasized, which goes back to the nitrogen fixing crops. That allows you to use all your farmland because you have special crops that actually fix the soil for you for the other crops. And they uh, drain a lot of land that is marshy, so they have more farmland. England. Eng the English will borrow from the Dutch and come up with their own innovations. Charles Turnip Townsend will use co uh, advocate continuous crop rotations with turnips, wheat, barley, and clover. Jethro Tull, not the band, will come up with the seed drill, so you have straight rows planted. Bakewell will emphasize selective breeding of livestock for beefier cows and milkier dairy cows and woolier sheep, things like that. The enclosure movement. Landowners consolidated pastures into compact fields with fences. It enabled quick use uh, of uh, agricultural innovations and market-oriented agriculture. But it also meant poor peasants could not rely on the commons anymore. So there's a population explosion. Why? Uh, well, earlier, the limitations to population growth were crop failures, diseases, and wars. So the reasons for the population growth was the agricultural revolution meant more food, the introduction of the potato, which is like a super plant. It really is. It grows places nothing else really seems to grow, and it's full of tons of vitamins. 
Transportation advances reduced impact of local crop failure. The 18th century wars were fought by professionals with limited objectives, so the wars didn't do quite as much damage as they used to. Uh, medical advances would not be important for population growth until the 19th century. Population statistics in 1700, 120 million. 1,800, 190 million people in Europe. In England in 1750, 6 million people. In 1800 in England, 10 million. In France in 1715, you have 18 million people. France in 1789, 26 million people. The British will be the first industrialists. Uh, the enclosure movement created a cheap pool of labor. The agricultural revolution will spur on uh, population explosion as well as lots of labor. More food, medical advances. Britain and Ireland's uh, population would be 10 million in 1750. It will be 30 million in 1850, so in 100 years it triples. The commercial revolution means that there will be capital to invest in industrial machinery, and uh, England also has the most advanced banking system in Europe at the time. The Enlightenment encouraged in invention and in entrepreneurship. Colonial holdings meant they automatically had markets to sell things that they produced. And geography in Britain. They had lots of navigable rivers, coal and iron deposits conveniently placed close to the rivers, and they had a long coastline with which to ship. British dominance of in industrialization in 1850. Half of the world's cotton, a one third of the world's coal, half of the world's iron production, a third of international trade. They would produce the great exhibition kind of before the World's Fair. Uh, in 1851, it celebrated economic and technological dominance, displaying engines, hydraulics, power looms at the Crystal Palace, a big, big glass building covered 18 acres. And the Industrial Revolution starts with the textile industry. There was a big global demand for cotton cloth, and you have these various inventions, uh, case flying shuttle double production, our green spinning Jenny further increased production. Then you have Arkwright's water frame, Crompton's spinning mule, Cartwright's power loom, and Whitney's cotton gin to speed seed removal, all in the span of about 67 years. British cotton output in 1785 was 40 million yards. In 1850, it was 2 billion yards. Massive increase. 